Good afternoon to you. Mark Suttoth, Hurricane Track here. Wednesday now, the 13th of August, 2025. Great to be back with you this afternoon as we examine what to expect with Aaron in the coming days. Definitely going to have some impacts, and you know what those impacts are going to be. Big time waves coming up for parts of the western Atlantic Basin. We're going to look at that and a very interesting re-examination of a GFS run from long ago, at least in model world, it seems that way. Way back on August the 8th, I'm going to show you a run that was a run for the ages and why it did not come to pass. We're going to look at that amongst other things today. All right, so again, thanks for tuning in. Let's get started. First, a visit to the interactive tracking map. I talked about this area yesterday. It was uh, an area of showers and thunderstorms kind of hung up in and around Central America. You remember that if you saw yesterday's video. Well, the National Hurricane Center went and tagged this, gave it an outlook as we call it. Low probability of development as this moves across this piece of energy into the southwestern Gulf and eventually the Bay of Campeche area. I'll show it to you more on satellite in just a moment. The big story, of course, is our tropical storm sitting out here in the open Atlantic, still chugging west at 17. But look at that latitude line right there, the point there, 16.3. Definitely lost some latitude, so it has clearly, you can see the past track history there, dipped south of west, so it lost latitude over the last couple of days or so. 45 mile per hour top winds, and of course, once it reaches a better thermodynamic environment, especially oh that's a terrible terrible little stroke line let's fix that uh yellow where are you and we need it nice and thick try it again once it gets into this area it'll really start to blossom more than likely making it to category three intensity and this is where we're going to start to really generate some waves and that's going to be a big problem down the road we will examine that as we move forward Zooming in on Aaron this afternoon, satellite picture. This is the visible high res. Much better organized than it was yesterday overall. Deep showers and thunderstorms centered around the southern part of the circulation. We call that convection. Pretty good banding up here, low level bands as well. It's got the structure. All of that is in place. The framework is there so that once the environment becomes more moist and we can knock down some of this shear that's hitting it from this direction, pushing those thunderstorms south and west away from the center. Aaron will really become more symmetrical. The pressures will lower, and this will become strong pretty darn quick. Once we get to the last frame of the image, though, let's pause it. And you can see there's the 16-degree latitude line right through there, and Aaron is just north of that with the center of circulation. Uh, I mean, we were thinking it could be north of 20 <laughs> by this point, maybe eh, a little early at 44, 45 west longitude, maybe not so far north, but boy, it definitely lost some of that latitude coming across as we've talked about. Don't think it's going to make too much difference down the road though, and I will show you why once we get to the computer model part of today's update. Uh, yellow, there we are. So check this out. Still. Still with the dust out here, you can definitely see some Saharan dust blowing off the continent of Africa up here, but it is much farther to the north now, and so this area off of Africa extending out to where Aaron is, a lot more favorable generally, but there's still that dry air. So less dust farther south, but still the prevalence of that dry, warm air, we call that the Saharan air layer, and that's helping in part to keep Aaron in check here and not allowing it to develop quickly just yet. But again, once it reaches the area here in the southwest Atlantic, it is really going to start to blossom and we should have a major hurricane on our hands by that time. A large one too, I'll show you that. This is the disturbance that the Hurricane Center has tagged with an outlook area, yellow, low probability. All of this energy should eventually make its way into this region over here bringing some rainfall to parts of Mexico, maybe southern Texas. The RGV, the Rio Grande Valley, you might get some rainfall out of that. That wouldn't be too bad, right? As long as it's not too much and for too long. So the old dashboard here over at Tropical Tidbits tells us lots of stuff at a glance. Again, there's the current position. We'll click on some of these images and single them out. 
16 north and some change by 42 west and some change. There you go. It definitely lost some latitude. I think that's interesting. But it probably won't matter too much because the old subtropical ridge has a break sitting out here. And you can tell where that is. Aaron's going to feel that and move northward away from our friends in the islands. I would say if I were a betting man, take all this pile of money that's invisible right here and put it on a bet in Vegas that Aaron does not directly impact the Caribbean islands. I think that is a very safe bet at this point, despite the fact that it continues to move slightly south of west because the ridging to the north just isn't strong enough to keep this thing shoved south. And we're going to look at that again in more detail in a minute. A fascinating trip back in time to an infamous run of the GFS that will never come to pass. And I'll show you. It's actually really interesting. Anyway, this is the clustering of the model guidance. Pretty tightly clustered for the first three days or so, as you can see here. Then there is some divergence in the guidance and the cone drawing it in myself. This is not the forecast cone from the Hurricane Center. This is just merely outlining the overall cone of the various guidance if you wanted to do so. And I did, so we did. And it certainly spreads a little bit because the further out in time you get, the more uncertainty there is. That's just how this works. There is more uncertainty with everything the more into the future we travel, right? Of course. Uh, looking at it from the vorticity standpoint, again, this is what I like the best about some of these features. You can really pick the structure out, and there it is, nice and round, sitting down here. I don't know what this shenanigans is back to the west just or east. Just more little areas of energy. It won't affect Aaron in the least. A little piece of energy sitting over Central America here. All of this will get its way again into the southwest gulf towards Mexico, northern Mexico, maybe southern Texas, and that will be that. This is the little piece of energy that was sitting over here a few days ago. Now it's moved inland over the southeast. And there's really nothing else out in the tropical Atlantic to be concerned with. So let us use the magic of the internet here and go back in time, way back to August the 8th. I believe that was a Friday. Yes, it was. 12Z Run. Some of you that saw this posted on the internet, on social media, uh, and people that posted the whole time frame, 300 hours out plus, you remember this. It was one for the ages, as they say. And uh, it's interesting how things did work out, though. So what we're going to do is compare that run, 12Z, again, back, um, what, five days ago now. 8 plus 5 is 13. Easy math there, Mark. And where we are now, and then sort of what went wrong in the modeling, what the model got wrong. And again, I was looking at this in my prep work today, and I was blown away at how easy it is to explain the changes that took place that will prevent what we saw five days ago from happening. So let's just run this out, first of all, and show you how it all began. This is the energy. Well, let's make it so we can see it. This is the energy right here that became Aaron way back five days ago. And then let's move this out into time. Hey, it did a pretty good job, the GFS did, with that northwesterly trek through the Cabo Verde, Cabo Verde Islands. And then on west it went at a fairly high latitude overall. Looked like it was going to be north of the islands. And indeed, it did stay north of the islands, north of Puerto Rico there. Through the Florida Straits, it went, growing into a powerful hurricane at hour 270. This would be August the 19th. And then it went into the Texas uh, area, just southwest of Houston and Galveston, maybe near Freeport or Sargent or somewhere down there. And uh, eventually over Abilene, a calamitous event, one that you just don't see. You don't see that very often at all. So why didn't that happen? Why won't it happen? It's really easy to explain. So let's put this where we are today. Uh, 12Z, this is the forecast time, five days out from that infamous run of the GFS, 120 hours out would put us to today. Where is it in relation to where it was forecast to be? I'll show you. Not bad. The GFS did pretty good five days out. This is where it is currently, a little south and west of where it uh, pinpointed it 
on that infamous run many, many days ago. So where did things diverge after this point? All right, so we're back to the eighth run, the run on the eighth, and let's move this out to uh, 168 hours. Notice in the modeling, huge area of high pressure sprawling across the tropical Atlantic up here near the Azores, which is right there. So we call it the Azores Bermuda High. Very, very strong, very stout. No question about it. And then it even extended ridging westward enough, honestly, into the southeast United States. If we look at this uh, current run today and move this out to 168 hours where it would line up to the same time frame, in other words, 12Z Friday, so 48 hours from now, uh, right there, uh, yeah, you can clearly see the difference. The ridge Friday, this coming Friday, um, much, much less there. So this is the 8th. This is the run on the 8th, valid this Friday. And this is the run today, valid this Friday. It's interesting, isn't it, that the run from the 8th has Aaron quite a bit farther to the north with a very strong ridge to its north, whereas the current run from today is farther south and east with less of a ridge. And yet, if we move this through the next uh, week, it clearly recurves it, which that doesn't even make sense. Recurving it never curved once. Well, I guess it did. It made that little curve right there, but whatever. I'm, I'm mincing words. So why is it going to be sitting here uh, on August 20th versus, if we look at this on August 20th, it had it way over there south of uh, Key West because less ridging now. And I mean, that's pretty easy to understand but how did the model, quote unquote, miss that? Well, the simplest answer to explain it to my audience is, it's way out in time. And again, it's that whole thing about uncertainty and different variables and just how the, the whole thing just changes and scatters. Just like I said once before, smoke. Smoke comes up and it starts to disperse. That's a good way to look at it, I guess. Chaos theory, whatever. We're talking a long way out in time, a week, 10 days, 12, 14 days, two weeks out. Many, many things can change, and enough things changed so that we are not going to have that nightmare run because there's just not as much ridging. And if we follow this along, it's easy to understand what happened again. Big time ridge sitting out over the Atlantic that kept this nice and uh, south, and then that ridge grew. Uh, you can see even more high pressure building here over New England, and it just hands it off over and over again. There's no trough in there to really yank this thing north. Finally, there's another ridge sitting here over the United States that just forced this on into Texas over time, and that's how we got that landfall. Ridge, ridge, ridge. And it wasn't until August 22nd that there was some kind of a trough that dug in right there. Let's get rid of my telestration. August 22nd, there was a trough that finally dug in, breaking the ridge like that. If we look at the GFS from today, what happens on August 22nd? Uh, well, there's a trough there, but our hurricane is way on out south and east of Newfoundland. So a huge, huge difference overall in the modeling in just a five-day time period. So what we thought we knew way back on Friday the 8th versus what we are looking at today in just the next few days, it is a vastly different upper air steering pattern that results in a completely different outcome with our soon to be a few days from now hurricane. So just a little lesson there in why we don't look at and put a lot of stock. Well, we can look at it all you want. Look, you can do whatever you like. I do. I look at it. It goes out to 384 hours, we all like to see. And then there's all these comments out there about how crazy the GFS is, it's broken, it needs to be fixed. Well, what, what are you talking about? We're, we're looking at time spans. And look, eventually I am going to talk to somebody, I keep threatening it, with uh, the INSEP folks, the National Centers for Environmental Prediction. Why do we even have models going out that far? What good are they? I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to get somebody on. We're going to do one of our Hurricane U episodes about it. I just have to slow down and become less busy 
so that I can schedule that and work around whoever that might be their schedule because we do have access to it clearly and we can run these models all the way out into the future 384 hours and we have AI models and this model and that model but it's really that three to five day time frame that gives us our best overall confidence with numerical weather prediction and sometimes as I've mentioned also even 24 hours out when you're talking about some place like Tampa Bay or a big city like New York or Houston or whatever the case may be two days before the landfall of Laura five years ago coming up some of the best guidance was sending it towards Houston while other guidance was Lake Charles and we know we all know how that worked out and the powers that be did a spectacular job not ordering the evacuation of the fourth, fourth largest city in the country Houston two days or so before Laura a category four hurricane all right so there's that little lesson for you one thing I do want to point out at the National Hurricane Center homepage speaking of dashboards there's a whole bunch of good stuff down here these little thumbnails this one here I need you folks who live along the coast here any of these coastal areas and even inland and you know people that live along the coast you need to pay attention to this going forward because this is a new product showing the United States rip current risk uh, some of the areas along the Florida Panhandle high today and some of these areas in yellow moderate low pretty much everywhere else right this is gonna really start to fill in with a lot more yellow and red as Aaron probably makes that turn somewhere in this vicinity several days down the road even Southern Cal getting in on the high rip current threat I bring this up because rip currents are an indirect impact from tropical cyclones and they kill people we don't want people dead if you're dead you can't watch my video so again I'm selfish about it I want you alive I'm kidding of course I, mean, I do want you alive but it's not just so you can watch my video it's the point I'm trying to make we must respect the power of these systems they get dismissed oh it's a fish storm it's out to sea nobody needs to worry about it. it's being hyped up whatever and then people have a funeral in a week because a loved one went to the beach didn't realize there was gonna be these big rip currents and they drown it is very serious and we need to make sure we hammer that and I certainly will as I have done and others have done in the recent years about inland flooding and the threat of uh, that effect we saw that manifest itself terribly terribly last year with Helene and this year all the flooding in Rio Doso and uh, New Mexico and elsewhere anyway it's all about impacts when it's all said and done and I will be focusing on this a lot as we go forward all right a look into the future not much to really be concerned with a lot of energy over Africa these are pieces of energy that will eventually come off and make their way into the Atlantic plenty of time to watch as we march through the middle part and then the end of the month and hurricane season naturally starting to get more and more favorable we would expect things to ramp up so just you know after Aaron we'll probably have more to watch duh it's mid-August almost what would you expect otherwise right so there you go hopefully you understood that little lesson earlier I thought it was fascinating looking back just five days ago and how much things have changed between then and now so we'll be on top of it I think the biggest thing to expect with Aaron rip currents uh, for the land areas of the western basin and we got to make sure we are on top of that going forward all right between now and then we'll track it and see what happens from day to day thanks as always for tuning in from all of us at hurricane track I am of course Mark Suttoth I'll talk to you again some more tomorrow